Hi, everybody. <laughs> Um, uh, Rainer already introduced me. I'm Bob Hart, um, communications manager. And I would like to start today's session um, with a simple question. And the question is, what do, you need, what do you think does it need to be an influencer? Any ideas? Any ideas? No? <laughs> to be an influencer, it needs one thing and one thing only, and that is followers. And I don't mean your Instagram or social media followers. I mean people who volunteer to go where you're going. I mean people who trust you and people who choose to go in the, direction, in the same direction. But I think the question more likely you should ask is, why should anyone follow you? But before we come to the answer to that question, I would like to give you a brief overview of what personal brand is. Branding in general is about building up a human appearance around objects like your products or your company. So what we're doing this because we want to create trust. And because humans cannot have feelings like trust for objects like your companies or your products, we're, we're simply adding human values, we're defining a tonality, and we even build a whole psychology around your company. So uh, what we're doing in branding is um, we create, we somehow create a mental image around objects by simply adding emotions to it that it makes, uh, that it makes much more tangible for the human mind. Amazon founder once said personal brand is uh, what people say about you when you're not in the room and I think this is a pretty good explanation because this implicates that all of you guys already are personal brands. The way you speak, the way you communicate, the way you inter interact with others. Um, that creates a kind of persona that is ingrained in the minds of your friends, of your family, of your colleagues, and even uh, in the minds of your business partners. So what separates branding from personal branding is you don't need to build up that kind of human appearance because you already have it. So the main task, the main goal in personal branding is to create trust, to increase loyalty, and to create awareness. So, um, what's the great thing about this if you use this as an entrepreneur, as a startup founder? And I think um, if, you, if you look at it today, and if you talk especially to a lot to, to German founders, they kind of perceive it as not a great thing or not as an adequate thing to be communicating that openly through their own personal brand about their business. So, not a lot of people are doing it. And, but if you look at it, I mean, uh, Testimonial marketing has been around for decades. I mean, that you try to lend the credibility of somebody to expose it to your business. And I think if you look at entrepreneurs, they're actually the ultimate testimonial for their business. Right? So it uses the concept of testimonial marketing, I think, in a much more consequent way than has been used in testimonial marketing. Because if you use, I don't know, Mesel Özil, therefore, to promote your business, um, that can be okay or that can be um, uh, the right fit, but I think there's always the risk that the testimonial brand and your brand kind of start to diverge as a company. And I think the great thing about entrepreneurs and their company, they're the ultimate testimonial for it. And why not, why not use it in a clever way? And I think what has also become, and why is it, has it become so relevant? And I think that's something, there's probably not a lot of, oh, actually there's a few things you can learn from Donald Trump. But I think one major thing, that you probably shouldn't learn all things from him, but I think one major thing, you know, why this is so relevant or has become so relevant, social media allows you to build a direct channel to your followership without media interaction and without media intermediaries. And that is something that is incredibly powerful. We don't like it, yeah? we see it with the IFD, we see it with Trump, but we also see it with people like Macron, yeah? or we see it with people um, in, in business. So and I think that is why this has become so relevant. It's the first time in human history where you don't have some kind of broadcasting institution that decides what's going to a followership, but you can decide directly. And that is a big chance. That's a big risk. Yeah, we see that in politics all over the place. But it's a big chance as well. And as an entrepreneur, I think that you, you should use that chance. There's lots of reasons we'll come to a conclusion why. Just giving you some examples. Very diverse set of influencers, yeah, yeah, like global superstars like her or her, him, but you also see people like, 
Alexander Graf, yeah, who also has become an influencer, more or less by accident. Yeah, so I think he didn't plan it this way when he started Kassenzone. We're also with one auto group colleague, Florian Hermsdorf, who is not benefiting from it to that degree, yeah, to also be honest. Um, but for him, it has become a marketing platform that now he uses to promote Spryker. Yeah, so uh, not only Spryker, but also his various other businesses. And I think more or less emerged by accident because he saw Nobody's really, I mean, apart from Jochen Krisch in the German region, nobody's really in a competent kind of way covering the e-commerce space. So he filled that void. Yeah? And I think that is something. And today, he can influence quite, quite a lot of opinions in a, I mean, admit it, a very niche area of business. Yeah? So it's not something that's relevant to the public market, but you can, or to, to, the, to the general public. Yeah? But you can build uh, an influence, or you can become an authority in certain areas that allow you to basically promote businesses there. And I think that's something, when you look at these different people, that's, that's, there's probably some people that are, I would call them direct influencers of their product hardcore. So like Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, they promote their products directly and in an in-your-face way. Yeah? And then you have the indirect influencer, I would call them. This is people like Gary Vaynerchuk, Alexander Graf, obviously on a smaller scale than Gary Vaynerchuk, that kind of indirectly promote their businesses. And my feeling, I haven't checked that like scientifically, but my feeling is if you're in a B2B setting, the in-your-face thing doesn't really work so well. Yeah? So you have to kind of mirror it and basically, oh, not mirror it, but mask it and basically say, okay, I become an authority in a certain field, and this authority I use to promote a business. But not promote it in your face, but rather promote it indirectly by building trust as an authority and then use the reach you generate as an authority to promote your business. Yeah, and the same thing is, if Sheryl Sandberg does something like Lean In, yes, it's not directly promoting Facebook, but it's allowing her to have access to politicians in Washington because she's one of the biggest promoters of you know, female empowerment in business. That gives her access to politics, and that, again, helps her to fight against the regulation that will definitely come uh, when uh, Facebook becomes bigger and bigger. Yeah? So, you might say, she's doing it for a good cause. And I would say, yeah, maybe she's doing it for a good cause. But I would say, she, she absolutely knows what she's doing. So she definitely also does it to uh, give her a platform to promote wh whatever business she's, she's promoting. And right now, that's, that's Facebook. And Gary Vaynerchuk, I think, is also a very good example. Not a lot of people know that Gary Vaynerchuk is actually running a 500 people digital marketing or digital media agency. Um, that he basically generates 95% of our clients he generates through his activities. Yeah? I mean, he also makes a business out of it himself. I mean, he gets like 100,000 euros if he speaks somewhere. Yeah? So that's kind of also a pretty decent business directly. But he also built a platform to build a much larger business, so, which is a digital agency. And I think if you look at somebody like him, yeah? I mean, he was an okay successful entrepreneur. He was an okay successful investor. And he made up a business himself, basically, by being probably the most prominent uh, uh, digital influencer kind of platform in, in the German-speaking region. Yeah? I mean, obviously, using mass media to achieve it, but he did an excellent job in, in this. Yeah? And, and obviously, I mean, he was a good entrepreneur, he was also a good investor, but he was not a superstar in that, in that area. I mean, if you look at what Alexander Zamba or Oliver Zamba has done in that area, or Klaus Hommels, a completely different level yeah, of, of uh, success monetarily and, and, and also influentially, but he did an incredibly great job. So I think there's, there's several examples, but what we want to show, and I think that's, that's very relevant, it's not something that somebody does in the US and that's not reachable. I think it's reachable for, for anybody. Yeah? It's reachable for anybody. And even if you, if you look at my own case, I can also influence and promote the businesses that we have now with the reach that I generated. And I just do that on the side. Yeah? I don't have anybody really helping me on this all the time. But still, by just doing it consistently, I now have a certain authority or credibility in a certain area. And it definitely helps us to promote businesses in a, in a very efficient way. And I think for investors, a lot more investors should do that. Yeah? And if you look at what Andreessen Horowitz is doing, they're doing exactly this. I mean, they're building a platform through podcasts, etc and then they're promoting businesses. And uh, just to yeah, give you basically a wide set of examples, but I think what you have to decide on, do I want to be an authority in a certain field, 
or do I want to uh, in your face promote directly a certain business? And I have the feeling now that being an authority in a, in a certain field is probably the most sustainable kind of position. But that, I haven't done any scientific study, but that's just something. But any, any business leader, I think, should start doing it a lot more actively than they've done before. Yeah? So if we come back to the main goals of uh, personal branding, um, I think we could figure out that the main goal is to build trust and increase brand loyalty. And the second goal is to spread it out in the world to increase awareness. And as a result, what we can do is we can uh, tremendously reduce our marketing costs. So let me start um, with explaining how you can build trust and how you can increase loyalty. Neuroscientists found out that people are willing to pay like 260% more money to your products when they trust you. So I think this might be a pretty good reason to have a closer look how you can build up trust and how you can increase loyalty. Um, there's two ways, two simple ways, how you can influence human behavior. One is by simply manipulating them. That means manipulating means uh, giving people specific incentives or disincentives so that you can uh, make them do what you want them to do, dropping the price, for example. If you drop the price, people buy your product. We know that. But the problem with uh, any kind of manipulating strategies is that it doesn't create any trust and it doesn't, it doesn't increase the loyalty. But in a marketplace <coughs> where manipulation is the norm, um, the question comes up, how can we stand out of it and how can we get heard? And the answer to that is, or the alternative to manipulation, is the inspiration. When you inspire people, people buy your products and they buy it again, and they buy it again and again and again without giving them new incentives. Imagine the iPhone, for example. People are waiting in line for, for it to be the new owner, the, the, the first owner of a product which is not the, the best product in the market. And this is because inspiration creates loyalty and trust and they are not inspired by a product. They're not inspired by an organization, but they are inspired by a person that isn't standing behind of it. So let's have a closer, oh, sorry. And there's one ingredient that we uh, will see later on that, in that uh, workshop um, that is missing to inspire people, that will tell you how you can inspire people and make them buy your products over and over again. So let's first have a look at how you can build loyalty and trust or what this is in general. Um, trust is a feeling that emerges when you are in a group of people with a common set of values and beliefs. And I would like to give you three examples in that. Um, the first example is a personal experience that I had when I was on vacation in the United States and I got to know this guy and uh, we didn't know each other and we figured out that we are from the same country. Actually, we both were from Luxembourg and this is pretty rare because there are not living that many people and so we felt connected right away. And I didn't know what we did, but I trusted him so much that when, I, when he recommended me a bar, which was one hour drive away, then I immediately took all my friends to that bar and we figured out that it was total crap. So um, I asked myself, why is this happening? And this is happening because when you're in an environment where you don't have the feeling that you belong, you may seek out for people who may have the same values and beliefs than you have. And this is, um, this is because we want to form trusting relationships. This is because we're social animals, and this is caveman stuff. Back in the time when we socialized, when we trusted people, we survived. So we still do, and we still want to do that. The second example I want to give you is um, the corporate environment or companies in general. When you are in a company, you are a group of people with a common set of values and beliefs, and this is what's happening at Project A. We, we have the, our values put on the wall very prominently, and so that is what we do. We trust each other because we're a group of people with common sets of values and beliefs. And the last example I want to give you uh, for what trust is, um, when I've been on a rock concert, I saw this guy putting a uh, Harley Davidson logo on his shoulder and I asked myself, what is, what, what is he doing? I mean, it's a corporate logo. Why should anyone do that? And, and this is the same. It's exactly the same. It's a symbol. This logo is a symbol for a group of people with a common set of values and beliefs that they want to show it. It's not about the company. It's not about the organization. It's about them. And this is what trust is. And 
to see, to better see, to better understand what kind of impact it has in a business environment, um, we'll have a look, a closer look at these two guys. Who of you knows the guy on the right? Please give me a sign. Okay, I would have expected it a little bit more, but who of you knows the guy on the left? Okay, it's two people. And this is surprising because uh, these two guys are uh, CEOs in very big and very famous car companies. So the difference between these two guys is that the guy on the right, Elon Musk, he is investing in his personal brand. And the guy on the left is not. He is investing in advertising to create trust and to make people buy their products. And if we have a closer look at the market cap, which is a pretty good indicator for the amount of trust that people have for something, because it is made out of these stocks, and if people buy your stocks, they trust you, they believe in you, that you give them back a little more money. And if we compare it to the revenue, which is kind of crazy, then we can easily see that people trust Elon Musk much, much more than they trust BMW. And this is because Elon Musk has become a symbol for a group of people, he has become a symbol for a common set of values and beliefs, and this is what creates trust. But we still had, don't have the missing ingredient in the, um, in the model at the beginning, so I had a closer look at these two guys. I think all of you should know them. It's Steve Jobs and it's Elon Musk. And I wondered what these two people have in common, and I'm sorry for taking that example because it seems so far away, but he was small at the beginning. He was not the big one when he started right away. So I figured out pretty soon by reading the biographies um, that these guys have one thing in common. They both are visionaries. They have a vision. And the vision of them is so big that it seems that it appears like being crazy to go for it, to aim for it. And this is what inspires people. This is what makes people raise their hand and choose to follow you. So as we can see, the missing ingredient for our uh, influencing in human behavior is the vision because the vision that creates loyalty and trust. Many people ask me, okay, now that I have my vision defined, what to do with it? What, what does it help me? What, what does it bring in my life? What kind of benefit? And this is very simple. When you're clear about your vision, every single strategic decision becomes so simple for you. Take Steve Jobs, for example. Steve Jobs believed in Mm, in that technology should seamlessly fit in our everyday life. Not that we should around technology, but technology should fit around us. And the point of that is, back at that time, it didn't. Back at that time, technology was just to support us, was just to help us in, in, a, in a way, and not that it should fit in our lives. So this thing he believed in was so strong that it drove every kind of decisions that he has made. And I have a wonderful story for that. Um, when uh, Steve Jobs and his senior executives went to Xerox Park back in the 80s, they, uh, and they were shown a graphic user interface. And back at that time, it was not possible to have a graphic user interface in a computer. This was very, very weird. And then he, he, he said to his uh, executives, guys, we need to invest in that technology. And they said, Steve, when we are investing in that technology, we're going to blow up our business. And he said, better we blow it up but they, but, than anybody else does. So this decision later became the Macintosh. So if you're clear in your, in your vision, then uh, becomes your, every single strategic decision you make becomes so much more self-evident. And even if it's expensive, then uh, techno innovative, innovation, doesn't have any, have, sorry, innovation doesn't have to do anything with uh, efficiency. Innovation is the application of technology to solve problems. The only thing you have to do is you have to find the problems that you are seeking out for. And as Florian said, uh, it has never been easier than today to spread out your vision to the world to create trust and to make people like followers, people who volunteer to go where you're going. You can use a free tool today and this is called social media. So the question is basically when you have something that you want to spread. And I don't know whether it always needs to be this big vision. I mean, not everybody's Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, but it also started small. And I think that is something. I think if you have something that's worth, worth spreading, how can you actually do that? And I think one thing you need to understand is that if you look at, um, and we're going to, to look at that right now, uh, the reach of traditional media goes down. Yeah? So even if you don't believe in building your brand, 
of a personal brand, what you have to acknowledge is that the, the traditional reach of media goes down. And if you want to be active on social media, one common thing is that it's cheaper to reach people on social media the more engagement you create with your content on social media. Yeah? So whatever bidding algorithm is out there, whether it's Facebook, whether it's the organic reach you still get on Instagram, and I'm pretty sure that you will not get too long anymore in the future, whether it's the organic reach that you still get on LinkedIn, which will probably also um, be, be cut off. Even if you want to get reach on LinkedIn right now, the paid reach that you will want to buy or on Facebook, you have to buy, you basically have today buy, um, um, buy the reach. The price goes down the more engagement you produce with your content. Yeah. So that's a common theme. And what's also a common theme is or, um, uh, something that, that's uh, like a fact that, now, uh, that, that cannot be disputed, that if you do traditional advertising and just put it on social media platforms, they won't work as well as authentic content. That's also a fact. The question is always to what degree, etc. Yeah, but I think what, what you have to see is that no doubt traditional media or traditional advertising on social platforms will work less and less and less. So you have to do something. And whether it's your personal brand that you put out there or your company brand, you can discuss the messages, you can discuss the level of messaging, whether you need a big vision or whatever. What's for sure is you need to find a way to spread the stuff or to, to reach customers through social media. And we believe that personal branding is a very efficient way to do that, but there might be other ways. We'll see in a few years. But I think what's, what's a fact is TV reach goes down. I mean, Germany is very resilient in that sense, and older people are very resilient. Yeah, but if you look at the millennials, when my son is 10 years old, the son, he will not watch ID unless it is like the World Cup final yeah? on ID. There's no way. So, and print also goes down, so you have to do it in, in that way. So increasing awareness and reach on social media is definitely key. Um, and also if you look at media consumption, it's scary. I mean, people consume like seven and a half hours of, of media per day. That's a global average. I cannot even believe that statistic. But even if it's five hours, it's absolutely crazy. Yeah? So how that, how that goes up. And this is a TV number. So people still, yeah, unbelievable, but people still on the global average consume 2.5 hours of television per day. I don't know what these people are doing, to be honest, but that seems to be the number. But I mean, the interesting thing is how internet usage goes up. Yeah, it's now on par with TV, roughly two and a half hours. <laughs> and if you then, and that is something that's very relevant, 80 to 90% of that, depending on geography, <laughs> of internet usage is social media usage or social platform usage. So if you look at those numbers, I think there's, nobody could dispute that you have to find a way to do something on social media and communicate your message on social media because all alternative methods, me methods just decrease in relevance. And if you look at certain target groups, I mean, for manufacturing, that might still be okay because the target group, I don't know, 45 years old or 50 or whatever, you know, people that have money and can pay that expensive stuff. But if you have a younger target group, um, then it's, it's much clearer. And if you look at, I mean, you know, I'm also 42 now, and I will not definitely not watch Posidon when I'm 70. Yeah? So I think that is... I said people watch a lot of factors. Because it skips it off the guten Dinge. No? Exactly. Absolutely. So, so daily social media usage. Um, and if you look at the 2018 numbers, it even goes higher. Yeah? So, and I think, even if you don't believe in what he said earlier, if you don't believe in personal branding, just this should bring you to the point that you have to do something about it. And if you see how traditional marketing companies or traditional marketing departments are set up, their org structure, their thinking, yes, they do some Facebook marketing, yeah, but the main, the main kind of effort of marketing departments today is not catering for this need. Yeah? They're still organized as they've been five, six, seven years ago. And I'm not even talking about the companies working with media agencies. Yeah? That's like complete disaster. I'm talking about companies that are, have a digital mindset. Yeah? So even as Zalando or Booking.com, I mean, Booking.com Booking is a search-focused company. Biggest Edward spender uh, in the world. And even there, you might challenge whether that setup is good. Yeah? So even of a company like a booking.com, because it does not 
in my opinion, reflect this development that we've just seen. So I think that is something one needs to recognize. And now, what I find very interesting, we didn't put Facebook here because otherwise the other things would look so small. <laughs> so this is just Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. I mean, Instagram, that's no yeah, big news. It's the fastest growing social network right now. Uh, outside of China at least. I don't know about China, but outside of China it's definitely the fastest growing. And what I find actually quite interesting, I mean Twitter is not so relevant in Germany. I mean for the US obviously you can see it's, it's very relevant, yeah? but in, in, in Germany it's not so relevant. But what I find incredibly interesting is the rise of LinkedIn. Yeah? That is something I find actually the most interesting. Because what's so great about LinkedIn? Obviously, you have business people on LinkedIn. Yeah, that's, that's great. And the other thing that's great about LinkedIn, that LinkedIn does not need to make money on the reach in the same kind of level as Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, because nobody cares about Facebook followers anymore, yeah, because you cannot reach them anyway unless you spend money. I think it still makes sense to have followers on, on, on LinkedIn, uh, on, on Facebook, because then you can reach them via paid campaigns, and it's still cheaper than doing any other marketing measure, yeah, so it still makes sense, but you need to pay for them. The great thing about LinkedIn followers, or LinkedIn connections is, they will probably keep it for free for quite some time, yeah, because LinkedIn makes money on subscriptions, and LinkedIn makes money on recruiting solutions. That's how they make money. They don't need to monetize the reach as directly as Instagram does, and um, as, um, as a Facebook does. So the chances <coughs> of getting organic reach on LinkedIn are quite high. And I think in a business context, it makes total sense. So I think every B2B founder that looks at these numbers should come to the conclusion that I should not just have connections on LinkedIn, but I should actually start sharing sensible content on LinkedIn, not on a daily basis, but at least on a weekly basis. I think everything else would not be a smart kind of decision because it's the most authentic content marketing platform that's out there and the chance that you'll reach a lot of people for the next couple of years are quite high. And even, and even if LinkedIn introduces paid marketing to a higher degree so that the um, organic reach will go down, even then, I mean if a lead on LinkedIn is worth a thousand euros, it doesn't matter so much whether you pay a CPM or three, four hundred euros. If you run a B2C business, yeah, it's a different story. I mean, then CPM might matter. But if you are a striker, if you are contentful, or if you are whatever B2B business and you earn a couple of thousand euros per customer per year, and the right 20, 30, 40,000 people worldwide that could buy your product are present on LinkedIn, the CPM is not so relevant. I would argue. I would argue. So, being present on LinkedIn and surprisingly also Zing. We don't have Zing here because it will actually be somewhere here. But if you cater the German region, I don't really understand why. Yeah, I, I actually, I would have predicted 10 years ago that Zing will be gone by now, but they're not gone. I mean, their stock price is like a billion. Yeah? They, they generate, they're growing. And uh, you get, if, if you use uh, Zing in a clever way, you actually get quite a lot of organic reach. They've really become a pretty good content sharing platform. So not to be underestimated. I mean, obviously just the dark markets, yeah, but it's, it's not a bad platform. But I think the main point really is <coughs> it's, it's reach that you will have to get because otherwise, that's my, my deep belief as a marketeer, you always have to think about where is your reach or where are the people that you want to reach. And if you look at this, if you're not serving this, you're more and more missing out on potential touch points. And so whether you base, and, and that's probably also one thing, it does not only need to be the founders or the CEOs of a company that can do this. I mean, every evangelist, I mean, evangelist has been a new kind of uh, beruf spit yeah, over the last <laughs> couple of years, very interesting. Um, my, uh, my next life, I'm also going to be an evangelist. Any evangelist for a company could, or would have to be here. If you want to be a good CTO in the sense of recruiting for your company, I think whether LinkedIn is the right platform for programmers, we can, we can discuss. Yeah? But I think a good CTO that wants to hire the right kind of people and wants to attract the right kind of talent, I would argue would have to be here and share their ideas, their architecture, what they want to do to attract the right kind of people to work for them. 
every CMO that takes their job seriously will have to be present here and say, this is our marketing approach, that is why we're doing it, to attract the right kind of people. So I think it's not just CEO or founder or whatever, anybody can do that. And that has the great advantage also, if you think about it. You build your own personal brand that actually also makes you independent of companies. That's also something. Yeah? That's also something. It's anyway, I mean, the, the power balance between employee and employer <coughs> has shifted towards the employee anyway, yeah, over the last couple of years. I mean, when I was like seven or eight years old, or still you were happy to have a job. Today, if you're well qualified, you don't have to be happy to have a job. You have the choice what job you want to take. And this even increases the power balance for an employee. That's not something that I like, because of most cases an employer, but I think it's reality. And if you are an employee, that is a strategy I would follow. The only thing is that you have to keep in mind, um, and that is something that people sometimes say, that I think it has to be somehow related to business and somehow related to the stuff that you actually do. Uh, so it's not something, you, you don't want to become Bibi's beauty palace, yeah? unless, <laughs> unless you want to you know, become your own influencer and then start a business based on that. That's a different story. But I think if you want to become an authority in a certain field, that's possible. But it has to be obviously connected ideally to the company uh, uh, that, that you work for. But it's definitely something that not only entrepreneurs can do, anybody can do that. Yeah? And why social media? And I think that is or what, what's basically one element here. I mean, we talked about why social media because it's uh, reaching a lot of people. And that's where the reach is going. One interesting thing here that I noticed, I haven't, again, not proven it scientifically, but I think it's also a fact if you look at it and there's enough anecdotal evidence around what's a very interesting observation you can make institutions or companies work a lot less or have a lot less impact on social platforms than people yeah? so if you take the total followership of Real Madrid and compare that to the fo total followership of their players it's dwarfed yeah? it's the same thing for any soccer club it's the same thing for if you look at, I don't know, if you compare the reach of universal music to that of the artists that universal music promotes, it's even more evident. Yeah? So what seems to be the case, and I mean I haven't proven it, but I think it's pretty clear that people communicate, or people-based communication works better than company-based communication. Yeah? So the strategy cannot be, I mean it can also partially be that Manufaktum starts to do their own social media more actively, that can be one thing. But I think you're missing out as an institution if you're not able to find the people within your institution that will start communicating. Because, as I said, I cannot prove it, but I'm pretty sure if people would analyze it, the likelihood of getting engagement on a social platform, and again, the level of engagement is directly correlated to the price that you have to pay as a CPC. High engagement, low price. That's a rule and Facebook and everybody will have to stick to it because otherwise they will deter their users. And that's basically the thing they're most afraid of. Yeah, so they're analyzing very carefully how much advertising can we introduce without completely losing users. And what they've figured out is the higher the engagement on content, on advertising content, the lower basically the churn for users. And if the engagement on personalized content or on, personal, or on people based content is lower than it is on institution or company based content, they will always implicitly prefer people communicate. So as a task for a company that would be somehow you need to identify the people that are willing and able to start communicating on your behalf. Yeah, so you have basically have the German ones know him, Herr Kaiser, from Hamburg Mannheimer, 2.0. Herr Kaiser 2.0. Herr Kaiser used to be this representative of this insurance company in Germany, and uh, you really trusted him. He was probably, uh, he was like this uh, Gebrauchtwagenhändler type guy, but somehow he was, or Onkel Dittmeier, yeah, is another one. The older ones among you remember, uh, remember him. No, but anyway, uh, uh, stop, stop it to joking. So you have to, to as, a, as a company, you have to master two things. Transferring your marketing program to social platforms 
And probably part of that is moving away from a company-based communication to people-based communication. And that is quite a heavy task, I would say. Because that's not what people are used to or like to do. Yeah? Um, and if you look at, I mean, you also have to, you know, because all the marketing communication that you traditionally see created by media agencies, etc., it's all very professional, it's all very polished, personal, personal based or people based communication often is not. It's much more important that it is authentic than that it is polished. But that is, it will be very hard yeah, for people because people that are guarding your brand right now yeah, and say, but well, we have to use this font and we have to say these things and you cannot say these words and you have to use these colors. You know, all this stuff that you traditionally thought is good marketing, I'm not saying that it, uses re it loses relevance. You still have to be consistent. But I think you have to interpret it new for these kind of platforms. And I think a forward-thinking marketeer or forward-thinking CMO or forward-thinking founder would have to accommodate that. I'm not saying that I have a solution for that, but I think it's definitely something that you have to think about. And frighteningly little people are thinking about it. So, is it yours or mine? It's yours. It's mine. <laughs> we use it. <laughs> so, you know him. <laughs> what is the essence of all of this? Yes, you will trust, as, as he said. So you're kind of increasing the conversion rate by being an influencer. But basically what you're doing by using social platforms the right away, you're reducing marketing costs. So it's not something esoteric, but it's basically about getting cheaper reach on social platforms. Right now it's still cheaper reach. And I would argue today it's still an advantage yeah, because traditional media still tends to work, traditional advertiser, advertising, but to a decreasing extent. So today it's more about reducing existing marketing costs. I think in a few years, when the shift has gone even further in terms of reach, it's not about reducing marketing costs, it's more about being able to reach people. It's not about reducing marketing costs. So I think that is something that one needs to um, uh, always have in mind. So there's two ways of doing it. The one is what we just talked about. It's reaching cheaper people in a cheaper way because your CPM, if you do it right with the right kind of engaging content, will be cheaper than traditional media. Yeah? I mean, if you look at, for example, what a Business Insider does or what a BuzzFeed has done in the past, I mean, they, they buy users for one, two cents on social platforms per click. Why? Because their content is so engaging. That's obviously not that easy if you sell um, uh, different stuff, but it still will be cheaper than traditional media. And the other thing is what Bob said, so you get people cheaper, and if you have the right kind of brand, and if you have the right kind of trust, you'll get more people to convert, or you get more people to pay a higher price. And that would be like the intermediary factor of, um, of, um, of the trust, and thereby you also obviously reduce marketing costs. Yeah? So you have several levers all leading in the, right, in, the, in, the, in the same direction. Cheaper reach is one, and then Trust being a moderating factor, increasing conversion rate and thereby reducing marketing cost. Yeah? So personal branding is not something that's esoteric, but it's actually something that's 100% ROI uh, uh, driven. Um, and that's why I would say, okay, it's definitely something worth looking at. So when it comes to the personal brand building process, <clears throat> You can, you can imagine it as a kind of a house. When you build a house, you start by building the foundation of the house because you want the house to be solid. So um, this is what people sometimes say, why do I need a strategy? Why do I need this, this kind of overthinking? Can I, just <clears throat> can I not just go and do it? And I would definitely say, no, you can't because when you, when you don't have your solid foundation, it is easy to be consistent and that will lose the trust. So what you, can, what you do in branding in general is you separate it into two big parts and one is the brand strategy. This is a part you don't see, it's the foundation part. And the other part is the visible part that people can see and this is the brand building part. So to uh, shortly show you what kind of topics you have to do when it comes to brand strategy, the first thing you have to do is you have to get aware, you have to get clear about your vision. And your vision is the definition of the world you are aiming for. It is, it is a world that you want to create. And this is um, what Steve Jobs and Elon Musk did pretty good. They wanted to create a world in which 
people live on Mars and they wanted to create a world in which technology should, should seamlessly be integrated in our lives. Like, uh, take Martin Luther King, he had a dream, the dream of a world he wanted to live in. And as soon as you have your vision defined, it comes to the mission process. And the mission is everything that you do has to bring you closer to your vision, to the world you want to create in with your vision. And this is the part that, uh, that you have to define in the mission. And as soon as you have that, it comes to the basement of, the, of, the, of your brand house, and you can see that you have to put, you have to define your values. And I think this is a pretty, pretty, um, a pretty tough topic, because I think every one of you has already their own values, but I guess no one of you has defined them yet. So I always say, just take this part serious, even if it looks like it is esoteric, like Flo said, take it serious, write it down, write your vision down, define your mission and create your values, because only then you know how you can communicate with your, with your followers and only then you can be consistent in what you're doing and why you do what you do. So the second part of the uh, brand strategy process is to uh, position yourself and this is, uh, Flo is going to tell you something about that. Yeah. I think you can either stumble into it a little bit by accident, as, as Alex Graf did, but I think as a company, if you start today, um, or as a CMO, you start today, and somehow define, okay, what am I going to do? You have to obviously find the people, identify the people that are willing to, to work with you. It could be yourself, it could be the founder. Um, so it, if, you, if you look at it from that, you will obviously have to define your audience. I mean, that's that's often pretty clear who that is. Yeah? So if you if you look at it from a business standpoint, um, then, uh, and that's a good thing in Germany. If you look at your, uh, analyze your competitors, at least in the German-speaking region, most of the topics that are relevant are not yet covered. But also if you look internationally, there's, we just looked at it for Spryker, basically said, there's nothing like Kassenzone or Jochen Krisch, for example, in the Nordics or even in the English-speaking region. Now, that's actually quite interesting. So a lot of the fields, although there's a lot of money involved, I mean, digital marketing is pretty well covered in, in a lot of uh, language areas, but a lot of topics are not covered in an intellectual and, and meaningful way by influencers in a B2B space yet. Yeah? So, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of room where you can still uh, uh, develop. And I think that is uh, actually quite fascinating. And I think that, and then the last thing is kind of what is your core message? And what is basically the stuff that you want to get across? Um, and I think that is something um, that obviously also depends on what business you're in and whether you want to be like a direct in your face kind of influencer or whether you, whether you want to be uh, like more the subtle indirect B2B one. Um, that would be probably like my positioning. But I also, I mean, I kind of slid into it, but I also said, okay, what are the areas that I want to speak to and what are my key messages? And for me, that's obviously like startups, startup financing, business building, digital marketing, and BI. Those are kind of my areas. And I only speak to these areas, and that's why I basically try to, try to um, um, deliver uh, or try to always come up with new kind of messages that I'm also, uh, by now, I've started to think about these things more strategically. I also look at, okay, what kind of businesses do we have in the portfolio? Like, for example, that's why I'm promoting things like CRM and, and, and uh, you know, existing customer data so much, because, because we have cross-engaged in the portfolio that benefits from it. Yeah? Uh, so I started to think about these things much more strategically now in order to promote uh, portfolio companies. And I think that's exactly what, what you can do with, with any type of business. Uh, think about who's your audience, think, see what com kind of competitors are doing already in that area. A lot of it is not covered yet. And then think about, okay, what are the areas where I really do want to become an authority and what are the messages um, that I'm getting out here. Um, so, but I think it's not, it's not that hard to do and it doesn't take that much time. Um, so the brand building itself, what are suitable channels? And I think... What I would see, what I would argue right now, where do you see most influencer activity? And I think if you're, if you're in the B2B space, it's pretty obvious. It's, it's LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn is probably the, the strongest and the most lasting influencer channel that I see right now. What we don't have on here, and I think that also complements this, is podcasts. Yeah? I mean, podcasts is kind of a mixture of a channel and, and a medium. Yeah? Because there's, I mean, oh yes, there's SoundCloud as a podcast type platform, but SoundCloud's obviously not doing that well. And then you have Spotify, which kind of develops into a, 
um, a platform also for podcasts, but podcasts kind of work also obviously across most of these channels. Yeah? But what I think as a B2B influencer, it's definitely something like a LinkedIn is a must is a must have, and 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 then podcasts could be something that complements that. Just to give you an illustration, Alexander Graf, for example, has a thousand people listening to him every day, every day. Yeah. So, listening to him, seventy five or something in the range of sixty to eighty percent of a total podcast they listen through. Yeah. So, if a podcast is forty five minutes or sixty minutes long. 65, depending on the podcast, 65 to 85 percent of the people listen the whole hour, the whole 45 minutes. Yeah, and I also did the calculation. I mean, I don't have my own podcast platform. I have it distributed on several ones. Yeah, so be, I'm basically going into the reach of others. But I'm reaching today. I'm reaching more than a thousand people a day with the stuff that I'm telling. Yeah, and it's niche stuff. Yeah, it's like digital marketing, startups, whatever. So I have people listening to me a thousand hours a day. Yeah, that's not bad for um, basically having very specialized messages. And I'm probably not using it as strategically as I could, but it's, 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 it's pretty cool. And, um, and that's just Germany, or mostly Germany. And I think, and it's still early, yeah? so it's still, um, and if you look at what Joko Winterscheid is currently doing, and Matze Hilscher, they're setting up a new podcast, and they think they can probably get 250 to 300,000 people listening to them per play. Yeah? And if you look at what Joko Winterscheid or Klaas and whatever are doing on television, yes, they might reach a million people on that, but the intensity of having 300,000 people listening to you for 45 minutes on their ears is a completely different level than what you would have a million people on TV. Yeah? So, and podcast is a niche medium. I mean, it's, yes, in Berlin people are listening to podcast or in Hamburg, but it's not something that is really has already spread to a broader public. Yeah, but I think if you if you weigh in the intensity of contact, I think podcasts already are uh, a very valuable kind of thing to have. So YouTube has kind of lost not a little, didn't lose traction at all. I mean, they still have a lot of traction. Lost a little bit focus, because I think also Google's not developing YouTube in the way that they should and could. I mean, they were alone, and they haven't so much developed it. I think they could have done a lot better in, in doing it, but it's, it's, in, it's incredible and you still get a lot of free reach on YouTube. And what you also see, and I think that's also a very good strategy that, for example, again, Alex Graf is doing, he benefits a lot from putting podcasts out and doing the same thing on YouTube. And he probably gets like 30% of the reach he gets through podcasts, he gets on top on YouTube. And on YouTube, the, 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 the user statistics are a little less intense, yeah, so people switch more on YouTube. So they don't listen to you for like 80% of the time, they don't listen through, they, they switch more often, so it's not, it's, it seems to be more snackable type medium than, than podcast, but still, I think uh, using YouTube is also still a very interesting kind of channel, because you get a lot of free reach, a lot of organic reach still, so YouTube is also not monetizing it uh, to the degree that, that other people are using the platform. And then obviously, I mean, if you, if you are the B2C space, Instagram is the place to be. Still a lot of free reach, but free reach on Instagram will definitely go down. I mean, the, the moment that the Facebook reach kind of stalls, Facebook will have to monetize the other platforms stronger, so that's especially Instagram, and that's probably also things like WhatsApp. You see now WhatsApp is starting to monetize on the B2B side because Facebook will have to show growth yeah, on, the, on the revenue side, and the only way they can show growth is monetizing Instagram, because that's the, 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 the other reach, like, meaningful reach channel they have, and probably WhatsApp. But today, it's still, it's still, it's still quite good. What, what I'm not so sure about is, for, for example, what Frank Thiel is doing there, or also Alex Graf, you know, share, sharing calendar speed, uh, like, you know, this calendar sprüche, uh, be as great as you be today, or whatever. Yeah? I don't know whether that's helpful, to be honest. Um, so I would not do that. Um, so I would, I would, because I think that's not consistent. Yeah. Either you're a deep content, deep content guy, 45 minutes of good content, at least like 80% of the time on YouTube or on on, pod, on the podcast. But then you cannot share calendar Yeah. That's not that's not deep content. That's often bullshit. So um, and that's why, yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure. And, and on Instagram, you cannot show. A 30-minute video that doesn't that doesn't work. So let's see how that evolves. So, but but, but I would say hmm, for B2C probably yes. For B2B hmm, I don't know. Zing surprisingly interesting. 
surprisingly interesting because that's what they, what they do basically also to, to keep the reach on the platform. Apart from recruiting, it's really putting the content platform out. Pinterest is kind of stalled, unfortunately, and in the German market, not so relevant, but they still have a lot of reach. Yeah, so active, in, uh, active Pinterest uh, uh, influencer, especially if you're in the B2C space, is not, is not so bad. Vimeo kind of stalls also, so they don't gain a lot of traction so much, but it's yeah, Twitter, as you've seen. I mean, they're still steadily growing, and especially if you want to reach the English-speaking market. So as a spriker, if you want to prepare the entry to the US market, being on Twitter is probably something that you should do. Yeah, but you cannot do everything. So I would say priority number one in the B2B is definitely LinkedIn plus podcast. That is something that I would that I would definitely follow. And then on podcast, you have the question, build your own platform or get on other people's platform. I mean, I for myself, I've taken the decision to do both. Yeah, so we have a project A podcast and I'm kind of lending the reach of other people. But the good thing for me is I get into other people's reach if I want to. Yeah, so that's probably not something that's open to everybody. But if you want to build your own podcast channel, that's quite a lot of work. I mean, we see that right now. We try to publish a podcast every two weeks. That's possible yeah, as a project A because we have a lot of people in the portfolio that we can interview. But still, it's, it's more, than work, more, more, more work than we expected. And right now, we're reaching roughly 1,000 people per play. Yeah? So it takes time. It really takes time to build that up. But I think if, you, if you're potentially thinking about building your own podcast platform, I would start early and start now because it just takes time. But then you will really have to be able to publish at least. I mean, Philip Westermeyer says, I mean, he's probably the has most reach probably in the, in the digital space in, in Germany. He reaches 20 to 30,000 people per play uh, with online marketing rock stars. It's not bad for B2B and, and, and language. He basically says he, they need uh, one per week. Otherwise, the traction really goes down. And what's also quite interesting, I thought if you have things like Gary Vaynerchuk on online marketing rockstars, that would work really well. It doesn't. <coughs> yeah? So the English-speaking people on online marketing rockstars, you actually, Philip Clark has one of the most listened to podcasts on <laughs> online marketing rockstars. Yeah? So more than Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, although we, I think we can all argue uh, that Gary Vaynerchuk is a little more prominent than, than Pip. Yeah? But still, you know, the, it's, it's so you, you have to decide on which market you want to serve. So if you want to serve the English-speaking market, you need English-speaking people on it. If you want to, uh, the, so it it's really seems to be specific per language region. But well, that, that is what you need to, need to find out. But still, I mean, we, we are going to stick to it as, as Project A. We're going to, so we're going to keep publishing a podcast every two weeks, roughly. We um, but that is definitely something... I can I can highly recommend. Um, but the reach actually increased very fast. So um, yeah, it's a lot of effort. It's a lot takes a lot of time. The whole personal personal branding process, but it's definitely worth it. Yeah. So that that that's so whatever you do, I think what what's one percent clear, and that's across any influencer you talk to, video and audio beat text by far. Yeah. So I think writing a medium blog post might be. Still interesting, yeah, in, in like nerdy type VC communities or so. I think if you want to reach a broader audience, it's not that easy. I mean, Medium is, is interesting. I think if you, I wouldn't start my own blog today. If I would start a blog, I would start it on Medium because they at least have the chance of getting uh, interaction. But I think if you see where it's going and where it's heading, my feeling is that audio and video beats text anyway. Infographics can still be interesting, but I think you have to focus, and if you have to focus, the focus needs to be video, and the focus needs to be audio. And it doesn't have to be high polished video. This is not what it's about. There's, this part is more about the content you're spreading, so you're spreading in the world, and um, it's, it doesn't have to be a high, high class camera. Your, your cell phone, putting it there, is totally enough. And that's, that's what Alexander Graf does, and he's actually pretty successful with it, and it works best. It works well, yeah. And the only thing that's difficult is like getting a good voice yeah. into that. Yeah, that's the only thing where you have to put a little more effort into. But if you use an iPhone 10 or an iPhone 8 and you get the, the voice thing under control, um, like use a mic, that's completely sufficient. I mean, this is like a 25,000 euro camera. Which is Not nice. that much, but uh, or, <laughs> almost. 15,000. But it's, uh, that's the, 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 yeah. the gain in quality of this is, yeah. is not so high. Not for this kind of audience, yeah. yeah. That's right. But again, it's like, 
our and, and but the only thing is how can you get that traction and the what we often feel that if you give this to a traditional marketing department they will then again go to the agency and they will produce something high class so it's it's something that you probably have to do with new people to be honest because if you give this to a traditional communications team I see that we have a lot of corporate investors uh, at Project A, and uh, I always said you need to do this, and you need to, but if, 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 if you give it to a traditional marketing department, you'll get something that costs 10,000 euros, yeah? That's, uh, um, and that is definitely something you, where, where also traditional marketing departments have to become a lot more agile and more pragmatic, and that is not that easy, because they still think, oh damn, if we, uh, you know, we cannot have Mark Opel speaking on my iPhone 10, and I would say that's completely no. fine. Yeah, no, that's completely fine. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't make him uh, less of a good CEO, I would argue. <coughs> cool, so, um, bum, 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 bum. Yeah. That's what we talked about. That's what we talked yeah. about. So, have fun, yeah, inspiring others, hopefully. Um, and, yeah, I mean, it's obviously, for some people, e easier than it is for others. I mean, if you look at Alexander Graf, for example, he writes his blog post really in one night. Sits down and writes like an Amazon analysis, and that, that's better than I see from most journalists for, you know, that, that work a week on this. I'm always uh, uh, so, but that also shows, and it's also if you talk to somebody like, for example, from Welt or Der Spiegel, or, that's also your chance, because all the the journalists, all the real journalists, uh, or the editorial teams of the, the the big publishing houses have been reduced so much that the journalists have to work so broadly that they don't have a clue of what they're talking about anymore in most topics. And that's really a problem, yeah? Because it used to be that there was like one journalist at FATS that would cover BMW, Volkswagen, and Mercedes, and he, was really, he really knew what he was talking about. If you read articles on digitalization in Der Spiegel, it's a nightmare, yeah? That lady does not know what she's talking about. It's a disaster. But that's your chance, yeah? Because if you know what you're talking about in a niche area, you can be the most competent platform quite easy because the professional journalism platforms don't have the resources anymore to produce a high quality content anymore because they have to be too broad. So being an expert and an authority in something is, is more possible than ever. Yeah? Uh, and that is something because if even the Spiegel isn't able to produce high quality content on things. Yeah, who would? Because I mean these guys are earning still earning shitloads of money and think about journals like or magazines like Kölner Stadtzeiger or whatever. Yeah? No way in hell that they can produce something meaningful on a digitalization topic. Who should do that? Yeah, and I think that's exactly your chance. So it's easier than you think, and uh, yeah, I, I would recommend or I would encourage a lot more people to try this on. Thanks a lot. Thank you, guys.